Stormtrooper costume. You gotta be kidding me. Even. I couldn't pick them from a rooftop full of faggots. Right. Positioning himself as a comedian, Steven Crowder has more and more focused on both news and conservative talking points. His work is often surrounded by jokes that many consider tasteless or offensive. In my estimation, Steven comes off as the pseudo-conservative late-night talk show of YouTube, often with offensive and controversial content. Regardless of the man's work or offensive nature, are the topics and points that he brings up actually accurate. Let's take a look. You know, I'm, I think that we would both agree that right now there's a, a national dialogue around voter ID. And uh, we've heard that voter ID laws are inherently racist. Um, that's what I'm talking about today. Not every other law that we're talking about is, it, uh, relates to voting. I haven't heard any arguments uh, at all that oppose voter ID under the, the, the guise of racism that I have interpreted as anything short of deeply racist. If there is one talent Steven Crowder has, it's his ability to phrase things. He can say them in a way that, if you try to call them out on him, there are words that do a lot of heavy lifting. He can even backtrack in some instances. In this clip, Steven states that people are calling voter ID laws inherently racist. The word he uses, inherently is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in this sentence. Inherent or inherently is defined as an adverb that means in a permanent, essential, or characteristic way. However, critics that speak to the problems regarding voter ID laws, specifically those that are talking about it from researched points of view and are generally outside of social media, aren't actually saying that laws are inherently racist. Most are saying that these laws lead to racist outcomes. There is a difference between something having an inherent racist aspect to it and leading to actual racism. However, in an ironic twist of fate, when you look into studies that analyze voter ID laws, you find that, well, they seem inconclusive or have mixed results. Two thirds of the studies I found say that the laws themselves aren't racist, inherently or otherwise. At worst, they only have a negative impact if the people running the ballot box are racist themselves. Only a third of studies actually say any racism occurs. Among the studies and articles I looked at included The Foundation of Public Opinion on Voter ID Laws by David C. Wilson, Obstacles to Estimating Voter ID Laws Effect on Turnout, and many others you can find in the description of this video. From the standpoint of someone wanting to know the truth, the effect of voter ID laws don't appear to have as large an impact as is presented by liberals and leftists. At best, they can be a contributing factor that is a problem only when combined with other integers. One cog in a much larger will that's individual impacts are negligible. Government issued photo identification, and it can cost a lot of money. Even if you get the ID for free, you have to get a birth certificate or something like that. It can be between $75 and $175 to, in some states. Um, and also you have to drive to these places to get your, your photo ID issued. And so that's an issue for people who are disabled, who are poor, might not have transportation for those in rural areas. In Texas, some people have to drive up to 170 miles to go get to their local um, voter ID place. So as we know, people of color are more disproportionately disenfranchised than white people. I don't really think I have to explain that based on statistics. I actually would ask that you do, yeah. Okay. Well, as it I relates to voter ID laws. So again, the way Stephen has presented all of this involves a lot of couched wording. Stephen specifically says people being disenfranchised by the voter ID laws. He keys in on the voter ID laws specifically. As we've shown, there is a marginal impact to persons of color at best. However, that is again, specific to the voter ID law itself. When combined with other things, it becomes a problem. But again, technically to be fair, there is some disenfranchisement. However, the problem is the larger issues come from across the board. I feel confident that even Steven would agree that historically there has been systemic racism and disenfranchisement for people of color in the United States. While I've seen him argue that it doesn't continue to this day, at least within the legal system, it would be logical to assume that even if all systemic racism, and racism of all kind in fact, was gone, that the history of said practice would still be impactful on persons of color to this day. You don't easily forget what has happened to you or your ancestors historically. This includes laws that over-criminalize offenses that disproportionately impact persons of color, making them felons that can't vote, 
Also, you have closures of governmental offices in heavily populated areas that primarily have persons of color. And of course, other things on the list, I really could go on and on. Sure, oh no, I'm just saying generally in terms of um, like the poverty line. And so more of them are like, are have less access to get IDs. So nationally, 8% of white Americans do not have, um, they do not have photo ID. 25% of African Americans don't. Mm -hmm. I would say that that disproportionate gap is big enough to say that, that, that there should be either a bigger effort to try and get African Americans specifically and other people of color voter IDs, or that we should get rid of voter ID laws. However, okay. I have- well, can, I, I, can I address those sure, here? Sure, sure. So a couple things, none of those numbers are accurate and I'll provide you with the sources that like we have. To, I can provide yeah, you it's, uh, my sources it's as 90, well. It's, it, now, there are slightly fewer African Americans um, with v uh, identification, with sure. government issue identification. It's not 25%. 86 to 86, only, can you let me finish? Sure, can you, finish? Can, you can 87% of black Americans, and it's anywhere, anywhere between 85 to 90, and white Americans 90 to 95. Addressing how many people do and don't have voter ID is something that Steven seems to be more accurate about than the person he is talking to. Though, he still seems to leave out some very disturbing information. Unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be a lot of current data, at least not publicly available. Most polls are 8 to 15 years old and appear to support the numbers that 11% of people do not have voter ID. Steven's analysis does appear to be consistent with what is found in the literature that is available. Though the studies are more pessimistic and lean towards the higher end of people not having IDs in the voter identification numbers. Also, no sources are ever provided, at least not as of the upload of this video. Um, but it is interesting that you brought up a couple of things. Rural areas driving further, sure. So that would be really disenfranchising largely white people who live in rural areas, I'm not, not necessarily black people. When analyzing urban areas versus that of rural ones, there are definitely more white citizens than persons of color. However, this is the type of bait and switch that Crowder often appears to do. As an example, let's say that in a rural area you have 150 people. Of those 150 people, 100 of them are white and 50 of them are persons of color. Now let's add Stephen's own statistics. Stephen states that 90 to 95% of white people have IDs. This would mean that 95 people of the 100 whites can vote. Persons of color, specifically black people, have roughly 89%. This means that 44 people of the 50 can vote. This brings our numbers down to 140 overall voters. With the changes in Texas law, the impacts of governmental buildings shut down and requiring travel to be excessive is specific to different rural areas, and it varies greatly. Let's assume the negative impact in our rural town will have an equal distribution. This means that 50% of white votes and 50% of persons of color will be impacted by the measures. So if 50% of people are impacted, this means that 45 white people will be able to vote and 23 persons of color will be able to vote. Of the original voting population, only 68 people are voting now, or less than 50%. This is a problem even without any consideration of inequality. And it's ironic, it would make the vote more lean towards the persons of color as they now have a more equal voting stance, only outnumber two to one versus being a third of the population. And these laws impact everyone possibly to even greater degrees. And it's funny because you don't see Steven fighting against the laws based on that. And there is yet another problem. There isn't an equal distribution of harm. Voter ID laws, historic oppression, poverty, and more plays a role in these numbers. So while the percentages of impacts to rural whites can be, let's say, 20 to 50%, the impact on persons of color can be 30 to 70% or more. So it's an unfortunate sleight of hand that I honestly don't know if Crowder knows he's doing on purpose. And again, he doesn't seem to want to fight it because it impacts everyone. What's interesting is that you bring up Indiana. Now, I think we can have a conversation about spending. Um, I think that it's necessary for people to have proper photo identification to vote, just as we do for many other activities, regardless of spending. My point is that there's no barrier to entry into places that have them, but it actually, interestingly, there's an inverse correlation with increased voter turnout. For example, in Indiana, that's a specific, I just use that because that's the state that you brought up, um, it increased voter turnout by about 30% across the board, including black turnout, and Barack Obama was elected well, as the first Democrat of Indiana in a long time, sure. and they have mandatory voter ID laws. I'll admit, when I did research on this, I just had to laugh. While there has been an increase of voters in Indiana, this is largely equated by most sources to be due in large part to, wait for it, mail-in ballots. And there are studies that voter ID laws can have a disproportionate impact in Indiana, Indiana specifically. 
You can see a breakdown of this in the study named Disproportionate Impact of Voter ID Requirements on the Electorate, New Evidence from Indiana. Citation in the description. And along with all of this, Indiana, even with increased turnout, is still in the 15 lowest states for voters to come and actually use their God-given rights. Even if we assume Stephen only chose this because the person he was talking with did, it's still a bad example of why you should have voter ID laws. At the end of the day, all this work is to safeguard elections and ensure that the representative of the people is the one being presented. Ironically, it appears to be the case that all of this is for nothing. It helps influencers get clicks and politicians get votes, but studies like that of the one done by Enrico Cantoni and Vincent Pons show that voter ID laws don't meaningfully impact fraud in one direction or the other. There are seemingly other reforms that can be conducted and have far greater impact on preserving the United States democracy. So in the end, this all seems to be yet another way that we find to hate each other. This is only a small segment of what Steven Crowder did. I'll include the full video in the links below. I wanted to show this because I think it's important to look at these change my minds and see where Steven is right and where he isn't. But all of this is just my opinion. What's yours? Let me know in the comments below.